Okay, good morning to everyone. Uh, or in, in some places in, uh, in the world, it will be also good night or, or good afternoon. Uh, this is the session entitled Update on COVID-19, its treatment and its cure. Um, the wave of, of pandemic variants constitute an imminent threat to humanity with an immense toll of human life, but there is light at the end of the tunnel. The first vaccines are on the market. More than 1 billion vaccines has been administered in less than six months. And also there are an increased number of pharmaceutical companies looking for a definite treatment to cure the COVID-19 or its side effects. The UK, for example, is running the world's largest clinical trial called Recovery with more than 12,000 patients taking part. It's one of the few trials to have given a definite view on which drugs do and do not work. The World Health Organization is running the Solidarity trial to assess promising treatments in countries around the world. And the principal trial run by the University of Oxford is looking for medicines which will help people recover from COVID symptoms at home. Also, multiple pharmaceutical companies are running trials of their own drugs. There are three broad approaches being investigated, antiviral drugs, that directly affect the coronavirus ability to thrive inside the body, drugs that calm the immune system because severe COVID-19 damage is caused by patients' immune system overreacting and damaging the body, and antibodies that can target the virus taken from either survival's blood plasma or made in a lab. It's possible that different drugs will work better at different stages, such as antivirals at the beginning and immune drugs at late stage diseases. Combinations of drugs also uh, be investigated. There we have several questions to discuss during this panel that has been planned by the organizers. The first is when will a cure be found for COVID-19 and other viruses? Uh, will national policies impede worldwide applications? How will cooperation on medical research be promoted? Uh, the fourth, what our panelists thinks about a very hot topic, how will a waiver on vaccine patents affect global supply? And the last question, if we have the time, will be about the anti-vaccines. Then let me introduce our panelists, it's a very distinguished set of panelists that I'm very honored to chair today. Uh, by the way, I'm Jose Ramon Calvo. I'm a, a physician, uh, a full, uh, former professor, retired professor in the University of Las Palmas in the Canary Islands and actually senior strategic advisor in the Barcelona Supercomputing Center and a president of the um, in Institute of International Relations in the Royal European Academy of Doctors. And uh, in my colleagues in the panel are Jean-Pierre Cubizol, uh, is a Swiss national founder and managing partner at CHC in Geneva since 2015. He was the co-founder and CEO of Edenweiss Group SA, uh, while well being a board member, member of Dental Planet in Geneva from 2006 to 2012, Jean-Pierre was founder, president and CEO uh, of CCT Group Management a consulting company specialized in performance and organizational efficiency with offices in Geneva, Zurich, London, Paris, Cairo, and Dubai. Ultimately, the CCT Group was successfully merged with HKP Group in Germany to become one of the leading consulting firm in Europe with Jean-Pierre as senior partner. Previously in his career, Jean-Pierre held executive position with Motorola, World Headquarters in Chicago, and Digital Equipment Corporation in Geneva and Paris. Jean-Pierre holds a PhD in thermodynamics and fluid mechanism and an EMA from Whitmore Business School at the University of New Hampshire in the U.S. Jean-Pierre served as a member of the Board of Foundation of ADES, the Refugee Education Trust, and the Advisory Council of Connected Aid. I will introduce then the other, later the other panelists, and I will give the floor to Jean-Pierre to uh, start with this uh, discussion. Jean-Pierre, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jose. Uh, hello to everyone uh, this morning or this early in the morning or late afternoon, I don't know. When I saw the, uh, the title, um, The Threat to Humanity, the question for me, who's not a specialist in virology or in epidemiology, uh, they say, well, what is the threat to humanity? Okay. And can we define 
COVID-19 as a threat to humanity. So I went into uh, a research and um, I found the World Economic uh, Forum report since uh, 2006. Actually, the WEF um, provide a report on the risk the members evaluate for the long term. And uh, on, uh, on the report of 2020, there are five risks that I selected. One, by the probability that it will happen, uh, which is extreme weather, uh, climate action failure, uh, natural disaster, biodiversity loss, and human-made environmental disasters. The five risks uh, <coughs> under the definition of impact, what the impact of the risk is, again, the climate action failure, the weapons and mass destruction, the biodiversity loss, the extreme weather, and the water crisis. Okay? So... Then I went and I looked at the, uh, the rest of the report. Additionally, all the members, and as you know, the member of the WEF are spread out all over the planet. Uh, they fear natural disasters, biodiversity loss, and water crisis. That's the one they really highlight, as well as, um, and that's probably influenced by the COVID-19, the economic downturn as a short-term uh, crisis um, and could remain for a few decades uh, over time. Um, they identify as well some political disorders depending upon the countries and the region uh, of the planet. Then I went and I'd say, well, how can I define the threat? Okay, so I found the graduation going from significant, catastrophic, and existential. So I concentrated on the last one, obviously. Uh, and the existential uh, threat is basically total or partial destruction of humanity. Um, and they include, I can give some example, natural dangers such as asteroids, volcanoes, uh, but also of human origin, okay, like in 1520, uh, where the Aztecs empire, despite, uh, you know, was totally destroyed by a smallpox infection brought by the conquistador. So then I look at the history of the pandemic. I mean, was there in the history something that could be, um, you know, taken as an example today? And I found the first one that we had in the history of, um, of the human being, at least as far as I could go back uh, into the history, was in Greece in uh, 430 BC, uh, where uh, typhoid fever, um, killed two-thirds of the population. Okay. Then uh, I, I took a certain number of dates just to see what was the evolution of, um, uh, of those uh, pandemics. In uh, 541, uh, the first plague uh, appeared in particularly the Mediterranean, uh, killing 40 million people, or 26% of the population at that time. Okay. Uh, then in 3050, the second plague uh, killed 200 million people, or 45% uh, of the worldwide population. The third plague uh, started in China. Something to say about this at the end. Uh, killing 15 people or 11% of the worldwide population, then closer to us in 1918 and 1919, just at the end of the First World War II, the first, uh, it killed 50 uh, million people, but obviously the population was much bigger and uh, represented 2.8% uh, of the population. 
The same in 57, where it was 0.34% of the population, and that was the influenza, uh, called the Asian flu, basically at that time, and the Hong Kong flu uh, killed 3.5 million or 0.098% of the population. So therefore, we can see two two things. Uh, first, it has happened in the past. And second, we can see that the decrease, the significant decrease in um, the number of deaths, if we take that um, that definition uh, as a percentage of the population at that time. Now, moving to COVID-19, uh, I took the latest uh, statistics, which is the day before yesterday, uh, because the WHO publishes uh, the, the, the whole thing every day, or almost by the hour. So that the, the, the count is 3.7, I just rounded up on, uh, 3.7 uh, million of deaths uh, out of 173 million cases of uh, COVID, uh, out of a po population of 7,871,000 as per uh, the source of the WHO. But uh, the WHO has published recently um, an, actual, uh, an actual count um, under more conservative estimates. Why? Because some countries do not have a census system. Some countries did not provide the data, uh, or partly. Um, some have accounted uh, deaths from other pathologies, uh, or natural deaths, actually, but sometimes there was mistakes. So basically, if we look at the estimation today, uh, or at least uh, the day before, uh, it's 0.047% of the population. But if we take um, the new assumption of the WHO, we will be between 6 and 8 million, which basically will run at 0.01% of the total population, roughly. So then I look at the R note. Okay, and I said because uh, we need to look at the risk of uh, all this as well. Uh, and I found that the COVID is a 2.5, so the up note is the number of infection somebody can uh, create with unvaccinated and um, untouched people, obviously. Yeah? Uh, it's 2.5, as compared to others such as uh, MERS at 0.8, Influence at 1.5, Ebola 2, um, SARS. 3.5, rubella 6, uh, smallpox 6, and uh, missiles 16. So with all this, um, I came to the conclusion, but that's obviously engaging only myself, uh, is that a threat to humanity? No. According to all those definitions, we cannot say that. However, um, we have to say that 3.7 million death is something that we should not repeat and find a solution for uh, that not to happen. For this, then I look at the interconnection of risk. Um, because what we had is um, a problem coming from the same basic cause, okay, which was a virus, and solutions touching many other subjects at the same time, many other factors. And I will give a certain number of those factors just to show the complexity to find a solution for those 3.7 million not to re-happen. The worldwide impact, there was nothing in the history that would happen at the same time worldwide, plus the mobility of people, because obviously people are moving much more today than they used to um, at uh, the last time. The adapted health system, national, regional, worldwide, we have seen the experience uh, for those in, uh, in Europe, 
uh, as far as the consensus, actually, the health policy was not in the charter of uh, the United Nations Commission. Okay, so that's the reason it was uh, so many problems. The universal health coverage, which is quite different from one country to another, it's an average of 64%. That means on 64% of the population is covered by a health coverage. That means the 36% are not. Okay, obviously that creates problem. Jean-Pierre, mm -hmm. sorry, we, we have reached the eight minutes, only to let you know. <laughs> okay, I have another two minutes, uh, but even less than that. Um, the homeschooling, ne never in the history we have kids at, at, uh, at home for schooling. Depression and anxiety. I talked to a lot of psychiatric, psychologists, and um, that's obviously a problem. Domestic violence, a huge increase. Large economic impact and commitment for the generation today and for three, four, five generations to come. Uh, the lack of consensus among scientists, we have never seen in history uh, scientists debating quite lively, sometimes a little bit more, uh, on, uh, on a TV platform, and the hope for back to normal without knowing what the normal is. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, and uh, now is uh, the turn to, to introduce uh, Dr. Gary Phillips. Dr. Phillips is an Orphomets president and CEO since 2018. And Dr. Phillips has three decades of experience across healthcare. And before Orphomet, Dr. Phillips worked uh, at Malin Croft Pharmaceutical, where he was executive vice president and chief strategy officer, as well as president autoimmune and rare diseases. He was head of global health and healthcare at the World Economic Forum. He also served in senior executive roles at Reckitt, Ben Kaiser Pharmaceuticals, Baujan Lom, Merck, Serono, Novartis, and Wyeth. He earned a BH in uh, biochemistry, summa cum laude from the University of Pennsylvania, an MBA from its Wharton School, an MD, Alpha Omega Alpha from the School of Medicine. Dr. Phillips also practiced as a U.S. Navy General Medical Officer, and he currently serves as Chairman of the Board of Nanobiotics, as well as Director of the Boards of Alderia Therapeutics and Rio Medical SA. Uh, Dr. Gary Phillips, my pleasure to give you the floor. Thank you. And, and so what I would say in, in sort of summing up uh, Jean-Pierre just uh, so nicely highlighted is that in some ways, what we've just, we're coming through right now is the best of times and worst of times for this pandemic. On the one side, if we look at it, is this an existential risk to humanity? I think the answer is no. And I think that could it have been in other times potentially, but there are some things which predisposed us to it, including global travel. Um, but there were some things that actually allowed us to get through it more quickly. And that's what I wanna focus a little bit on as we think about the treatment and its cure. So I think that there were some successes that came out of previous experiences. First, we had recently experienced over the past couple of decades other coronavirus infections like SARS and MERS, which had um, allowed certain cultures, especially Eastern cultures, to understand how to deal with it from a public health perspective. So the social distancing and the mask wearing and the, and the sanitation, all of those hygienic factors to understand those from the respiratory illnesses of SARS and MERS were very important. But equally important was the more recent experience with Ebola virus in Africa. And in fact, if we think about the way in which the world was able to cooperate, and you know, I, as was just said, I actually was at the World Eco Economic Forum, I was head of health healthcare for, for a bit there. Uh, and it was just after Ebola, there was a task force put together cross-functional, cross-industry, cross-societal, to think about pandemics as a key risk factor to the world, um, really with Ebola as the, uh, the test case, or let's say the case that spurred the origination of that. Now, even with all of that, I think that the, the health system succeeded in some areas and failed in others. From a failure perspective, I think uh, you know, from the worst of times point of view, it was the worst of times in that there were populist, society, populist um, governments in place around the world, and those were the ones that did most poorly, including my own at the United States. I think we saw that in Brazil and some other countries were particularly 
poorly hit because you ended up then not having cohesion to combat the virus. But on the same, and at the same time, we saw that organizations like the Centers for Disease Control in the U.S. and the World Health Organization, centered out of Geneva, uh, were not as effective as they might have been in coordinating uh, public health around the world. But what I what I am most proud of as a member of sort of global healthcare, especially the industry that's putting together technologies to combat illness, is the way in which uh, scientists collaborated. Within a month after the SAR, uh, after the uh, SARS-CoV-2, which underlies COVID-19, was rep- was recognized to be the causative agent for COVID-19. The genomic sequence was completed and was actually published globally. And from that instance, the National Institutes of Health in the U.S. and other uh, other um, health public health organizations and scientific organizations around the world started working on the molecular biology of SARS-CoV-2, which led to the understanding of the, of the spike protein, which ultimately led to the development of successful vaccines in a record amount of time. I remember in March of 2020, which wasn't that long ago, looking out my window and seeing that the, ro- the, the world was almost desolate because no one was on the streets and the stock market is dropping. And I, I reflected thinking, oh, my God, we're, this is, <laughs> is going to be bad because we had never seen the development of a vaccine in a very short period of time. My, at that point, my view was that perhaps the best we could do is come up with some successful antiviral therapies, as we've seen for diseases like influenza and uh, human immunodeficiency virus and, hep- and hepatitis and others, where antiviral therapies often precede vaccines. So no one would have envisioned that we would have been able to come up with several successful vaccines in such a short, short period of time. So I, what I want to do is I don't want to take a lot of time, just want to kind of review as was said at the outset, what are some current therapies and then what's going on as we look for additional therapies and prevention that can help us with this pandemic. And as I think we all understand, this is not the last, right? As was just, uh, as Jean-Pierre just said, (laughs) pandemics and plagues have, have, have hounded humanity since recorded origin. And so we understand that we will likely have one again. So what can we learn from this one? So I don't want to go through each of these therapeutic areas in, in depth, but do want to talk a little bit about how each is used. So as was uh, as Ramon said in the beginning, uh, what we have at the outset are antiviral therapies. And, and you know, the, the lead one that came most quickly was remdesivir, uh, which actually came out of the Ebola, uh, was first developed by Gilead for the Ebola um, virus. And so this actually inhibits the replication of the virus uh, and is somewhat effective, but not hugely effective. It wasn't designed specifically for the SARS-CoV-2 virus, but it does have an, an it does have an effect on the replication of the virus. Um, there were a number of uh, antiviral therapies which were tried. Many of them popularized, like hydroxychloroquine, ivermectin, which hydroxychloroquine I think we all know is an anti-malarial. Ivermectin is an anti-worm agent, anti-helminthic product. Neither of these products in in really rigorous clinical trials seem to have worked very well. And so they've largely been discredited as treatments. Um, But then other things were found to uh, also affect the disease. And again, as Ramon said in the beginning, uh, things that modify the hyperimmune response to the virus seems to be affected. The first came out of the UK, which was a study of dexamethasone. Dexamethasone is an old steroid, which has been around for decades but seem to work well at dampening the hyperimmune response to the virus, especially when paired with remdesivir, um, seems to work well, especially in, in mild to moderate disease, especially when patients are, are first in the hospital. Uh, then the next thing that came were, were immunologic therapies, which are not vaccines, directed at the virus. These took the, play, the, took the shape of a monoclonal antibody cocktails, which were uh, formulated against the virus, which were derived in you know production scale, more uh, industry standard to treat the virus. Convalescent plasma from those patients who have actually recovered from the virus is also used. Convalescent plasma does not seem to have had the same benefit as actually the monoclonal, monoclonal antibody cocktails. And so these therapeutics form the backbone of therapy for patients up until the end of 2020. All doctors could do was to try to provide 
these kinds of therapeutics combined with supportive care, which includes oxygen therapy, turning, we, we found as we turn patients on their stomachs, it seemed to help as well. Um, uh, other therapeutics, you know, antipyretics to stop fever um, are also quite important. But ultimately, uh, the thing that has been most miraculous has been development of the vaccines. The vaccines today take two primary forms, um, the mRNA uh, vaccines. And I think, again, this is, this is where molecular biology has been incubating, so to speak, a technology over decades without a specific application. So up to, to now, mRNA therapeutics or mRNA applications have more been um, animal applied than human animal applied. And in fact, it turns out that because of the spike protein, the mRNA approach seems to be quite well suited because you can express the, uh, the spike protein through an mRNA delivery to normal cells. And by the body seeing that spike protein, they form antibodies and develop cell immunity against it. So that has been miraculous that a, a technology went from no human application to the leading application with 94 to 95% efficacy um, and, and potentially long lasting duration has been truly magnificent. The second one, which is older technology have been viral vector vaccines. And these take like the Johnson and Johnson vaccine, the AstraZeneca vaccines, where they take a known virus, say for example, in the J&J vaccine, human adenovirus type 26, and you engineer a piece of the coronavirus into it, which then expresses it and works similar then to an mRNA and that you form antibodies and immune response to a spike protein, which is important for the SARS-CoV-2 entry into the, into the cell of the lung. And so I think there has been incredible progress over the past uh, 15, 16 months or so. Remarkable progress. Uh, but there are a number of things. I mean, look, the, the virus is not gone. There are some places where, and I'd say the U.S., Israel, the U.K., uh, the European Union or West Western Europe in particular, has started to get its arms around vaccination. And you've seen a consequent reduction in both infection as well as death. Uh, but there are many societies which are still dealing with this. And so I'm not going to go into health equity because I, I only have a certain period of time to speak. But obviously, health equity is important because unless we actually completely crush this virus around the world, it will continue to plague us because it will continue to mutate and come back and infect those societies who may have already been vaccinated. So there are a number of, uh, of activities ongoing to find new therapeutics, and there are ways in which uh, companies are trying to advance the, the vaccines. And so on June 3rd in Nature Communications, there was a study shown that at Scripps Institute, they screened 12,000 drugs, 90 found some efficacy in 13 have been shown to have potential therapeutic application. And that gives us hope that ongoing therapeutic discoveries will be found. So thank you for that. Thank you very much, Gary. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Sarah Isbell. Uh, Sarah is the CEO, co-founder and president of Mercaptor Discoveries. Um, previously, she was a senior scientist and head of research and drug discovery of Raptor Pharma after starting the company in 2006 with its co-founder, Chris Starr and Todd Zankel. She has an extensive background in neuroscience with a specific training and expertise in neurodegenerative diseases and conditions, including a recently published paper in drug design and development. Uh, Sarah has 20 years in drug development, as I told you, 10 years in management, author of several publications and patents. Sarah leveraged her training and experience to develop captons, including a recent study positive preclinical proof of concept in the epilepsy therapy screening program run by the National Institute of Health and concrete by the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke. Sarah holds a BS in Neurochemistry, Biochemistry, Molecular Biology from the University of Irvine, California. Sarah, the floor is yours. If you prefer, really, as you are an, a neuroscientist, I would like uh, that, uh, I think that your interest uh, is in the neurotrophic effects of COVID-19 and say your teams hold the key uh, to the cure. Uh, could you please to tell us more about this uh, central ner uh, nervous system effects seen by COVID and describe your potential treatment? 
Yes. It's a quite quite a bold statement, isn't it, that we found the cure or something like that. But I guess it's bold times, really. Um, when I saw the title of this panel, I kind of wanted to change it a bit and call it COVID. Um, it's treatments and cures that will come out of it um, for other, you know, many other types of diseases, uh, specifically for the brain. Um, Gary, you mentioned that the virus isn't going to go anywhere and it's still around. Well, it is actually still around in most people in the brain. Um, this virus uh, hypothesis now is um, mm -hmm. that it will reside in the brain. It will stay in our brain dormant um, for life, just like the JC virus. Um, and the COVID, I don't know if you've heard about long COVID. And what I'm most interested in is this uh, phenomenon where months after a patient has come down with COVID symptoms, they develop, you know, brain fog. We have all heard of the loss of s smell and taste, which is uh, some acute neurological effect, but there's this phenomenon coming up now of brain fog. The patients claim they start to feel like they have Alzheimer's degree, um, disease. They're like forgetting who they are. They're becoming confused. Um, and there's two other things that are happening with long COVID. The other thing is um, the person gets out of breath a lot. They're finding just all of a sudden they're having a very hard time walking upstairs. And then the third thing is if you get up really fast, people, they're starting to feel dizzy. So that's interesting because you have respiratory, right, with um, running out of breath. You have dizziness, which is cardio. And then you have the brain, which is, you know, CNS. It's like the virus is still the residual of the immune system. They're hypothesizing is what's coming back and causing these other uh, phenomena. But um, I believe that COVID-19 is actually going to bring about a revolution for the biggest plague that has um, affected mankind. And that's degeneration of the human brain. There is nothing for it. Even with today's news, I will repeat, there is nothing for uh, any degenerative diseases, for epilepsy, TBI, acute trauma. And it's not for a lack of knowing. They know how to do it. It's been researched extensively by, by some brilliant minds. But there's one issue. And I believe with COVID-19 and having a fast track with the FDA to get out a drug for neuroinflammation with a COVID indication will bring about, um, you know, what do they say? If it's once it's on the proof of concept, like on the market. Um, so what is it that I'm telling? We discovered a way that we can get rid of all toxicity issues with giving a neurotherapeutic. The issue is you cannot dose any of these drugs to a patient without having serious consequences. There are two processes that happen in the brain, which are the underlying cause of all pro uh, progression. And that's the immune surveillance, so immunological, and there's the excitation of neurons, hyperexcitation. These are the two pathways everybody tries to stop with Alzheimer's ALS, try to stop like GABA, stop calcium uptake, prevent the neuron from firing, or they'll come and, you know, try to inhibit, inhibit, um, inhibit BX27, you know, or these other ones for IL-17, all these immunologists. When you do that, you shut it off for the whole brain. The brain needs to continue to surveillance its area, right? We have JC virus in us. Uh, the measles virus they find is never gone away. They found uh, children and adults will come in years after having measles, six months to years, complaining of some neurological problem and die. They look in their brain post-mortem and find their brains are riddled with measles virus, which they could not detect in the CNS when they looked. The same thing happened with dengue fever. This virus, you know, someone came in and he was having some feeling like he had some degeneration, was what the doctor, you know, diagnosed him with, and they checked for dengue because he had some history where it could have been that. 
they didn't find it. When he passed away, they looked full of dengue virus everywhere. Same will be true of COVID, they believe. That is, and we can't detect it. Well, this will, they say within five years, the cases of Alzheimer's are going to skyrocket, right? So we're looking in a world that because of a pandemic like this, the virus on such a large scale, we're going to see a lot more degeneration. Therefore, the, you know, the urge for, you know, a company like me, no one wanted to listen to, right? Everyone was like, oh, you guys are crazy. Come back when pigs fly. And I say pigs are flying now. We have the data. We have the proof. And we've just been screaming to everyone. And um, with this happening, here's our opportunity to show, hey, look, this, this can really happen. Here's a secret. You don't make these drugs to completion. You synthesize the drug that's going to inhibit that protein one step before it's completed. You leave the final step to be an oxidation step. And what we discovered and have a patent on is that around pathology of a brain, regardless if it's from a stroke or a hit to the head or Alzheimer's or a virus, which they're now, with all this new research, finding that most non-hereditary degeneration has come from a virus in the past. You can um, you you don't make it all the way. Chemistry in that area can oxidize a thiol. So what we can do now is have the pathology generate its own drug. You give the patient a not completed drug and we've done this in animals and because it's chemistry, no biology involved, no receptor, nothing that won't translate. Therefore, it will work in animals, it will work in man, it will work in bacteria. And you can now have location, time, duration, amount of dose, you will stop IV. The implications are enormous, and it kind of makes sense that it takes something like a pandemic, I think, to be able to, you know, shake up things and, and start getting a lot of uh, neurotherapeutics out for everything. Oh, so this can be applied, I should say, that large pharma, we want everyone to try. We're putting out a press release tomorrow with this to say, everyone just take your molecule, your small molecule, and don't finish synthesizing it. Just leave the oxidation step last. Medicinal chemists never believed a thiol could oxidize like this. Think it would take an enzyme, but that's what we discovered, and we discovered it by accident. And um, it is, it is going to change the face of, of neurology, economically too. I mean, this is it's going to be quite big, and you're the first ones to hear this. <laughs> The press release goes that we have our patent, it's published, so there's nothing confidential anymore, and we just want people, you know, to, to start trying it. Get in the lab, try it. It doesn't cost much. It, it's a pill. These are oral molecules. When they're not oxidized, they're harmless. They go across the brain. So that's, uh, yeah, I, I think COVID-19 will, will bring something big to neurology. Mm -hmm. I really do. So, thank you very That's much. That's a lot, isn't it? Yes, <laughs> yes. no, no. It's, it's, very, it's, very, it's, it's, it's very interesting. And uh, I have a very small question for you, uh, Sarah, that someone is asking to me here. Is, uh, uh, can you describe very briefly uh, uh, how can this drug can be helpful for patients infected with COVID-19? Because so COVID-19 is going to reside in uh, your brain. So two things that are hypothesizing will happen. Over time, it will flare up. If anything happens in your immune surveillance in your brain, say you get, another, you get sick from something or you get stressed, that virus in COVID-19 could flare up again and you become contagious and now you've, you've generated it. Upon flaring up, it's going to use the immune system. Well, our drug, when... When the immune system flares up above what it should be, it will oxidize the molecule, turning it into the drug. So as soon as it, the virus starts to, you know, aggravate the brain tissue, it's the flare-up of the immune system that triggers hyperexcitation that pops neurons, you get a cascade. So having it on board 
Whenever that happens, no one knows when it's going to happen in their lifetime, years, years down. And every human could probably have it. We don't know how many people got contaminated. I mean, if you contaminated, if you look at the populate of number of people that had it, and you say it should only be like, you know, one or two point four percent, you realize that probably, you know, most the whole population has has had it in one way or another. The other way is that this brain phenomenon's coming on way after you've been exposed to COVID because of the immune system, which is why I won't get vaccine. But that's a different platform. I think it could be the immune system that's reacting to the virus is causing the neurological problems which means a vaccine is going to cause a neurological problem. And down the road, this immune problem is going to start seeing things on your neurons that look like that virus. There's lipid glycoproteins on the neurons that will match parts of that S protein. And over time, with sort of genetic shift, when it sees your brain flares up, when that flare-up happens, if our drug is there on board or any pharmaceuticals drug on board to inhibit the immune system, it will oxidize and become the drug only when it flares up, right when it flares up. We don't need to know PD about degeneration anymore. We don't need to know where or when or how long or what to dose. Pathology, no, it will dose itself. And then when it comes down to the levels that the body needs it to work, the oxidation reaction stops. It's just chemistry. It's beautiful. It's so beautiful that you know it's true. When we saw it, we that's why we started a company, just to check this out and gave every dime we had. We don't even have a penny left right now. Nobody has a penny. Seriously. We we it's I won't go into all that. But um, we're slaves to, to this mission now because we we saw this and we've reproduced all the experiments and we it's completely clear 100 percent. don't need statistics when you see a hundred yes and a zero no it's like what are the chances it's a hundred percent yes <laughs> so well, yeah no we have two, two, two minutes and a half i would like to also uh, jean-pierre you have any comment yeah <clears throat> i'd just like to add to all this um some of the things that we normally uh, not touching i mean we found that the virus is deadly but um, according to the WFP, uh, the, the World Food Program, 1.2 million of uh, billion, uh, sorry, uh, 1.2 billion of people would be seriously food insecure by the end of 2021. Okay, that's uh, when I look at all this. I, I, I look at the future and I said, what are the vulnerability? of humanity in, in, in large terms. Okay. Well, 1.2 billion, that's a large number uh, in percent of the 7.8 uh, billion of the total population. That's add the complexity uh, of things because we have absolutely no idea on what's happening on those people today. Yeah. And uh, just to, to conclude, there are the SDG, uh, the sustainable um, development goals that the United Nations uh, has voted uh, by, by unanimity in uh, 2015. Um, and it's quite interesting because if we achieve that, that will be some kind of support to all what was explained very well today. Uh, but the vulnerability are very interesting. We have one minute. Uh... And Gary, if you have any comment to end this panel. Yeah, I, um, no, I just thank, thanks you for the opportunity uh, to, to speak uh, today. This is a obviously very relevant topic. Uh, I appreciate Sarah's insight um, on potentially ways to combat uh, neuro COVID in the future. But uh, I think it really, in the end, there's only one way to, 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 to overcome a challenge like this, and that's through collaboration on a global level. We got some things right. We didn't get other things right. Hopefully, we learn for next time, and we can take some of these barriers down, even to put an end to this virus now, because we're still not collaborating as much as we should. Mm -hmm. Sarah, last <laughs> word for you. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Jose, for yeah having me here. And I just think this is a great platform to have these conversations and to say things that, you know, like, like, you know, should we take that scene, these touchy 
you know, um, topics. I think this is great to have a place to talk about okay. it. So, okay. yeah, thank you. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much to everyone and also the attendees. We are now on time and then we will stop the streaming. Uh